Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, MSU Extension, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, the Northern Pulse Growers Association, and the Gallatin Gardeners Club. Welcome everyone to Montana to Montana Ag Live. I'm your host, Tim Seipel, sitting in the chair for Jack Rieselman tonight. We have an excellent panel of MSU Extension specialists for you, focusing on weeds, horticulture, beef extension, and forage crops. So if you have any questions about beef, horticulture, weeds, or forage crops, please give us a call and, and send in your questions. The panel tonight consists of Sam Wiffles on the let on the far end. He's the MSU beef extension specialist. We have Hayes Goosey. He's MSU's uh, extension forage specialist. In the middle, we have Jane Mangold, MSU invasive species um, specialist. And then we have Abby Saeed, MSU's horticultural specialist for gardens, bugs, pests, and trees. <laughs> And I'm Tim Seipel, Cropland Weed Extension Specialist. Um, so if you have any questions about crops and weeds, please let us know. Tonight, answering the phone, we have Nancy and Jordan on our phone lines. So give them some questions to send up here to us. So Hayes, we'll let you go. Uh, tell us about what you're doing in your research uh, at MSU and in forages around the state. Sure, um, so we've got quite a few different projects that we have. A lot of them relate to uh, soil fertility. We have a, a, a couple students, uh, graduate students that are working on nitrates, um, soil nitrogen availability and its relation with sulfur. Also alfalfa and some phosphorus, um, working with some of the research centers on those projects, also on some perennial grass and nitrogen needs, um, depending on times of year that we would fertilize those. Um, we've got a project I uh, got set up with Sam. Let him talk a little bit, a little bit more about that. He was kind enough to, to allow me to, to hop on board with a great project and a great idea. So we'll let him talk a little bit about that. We're working on alfalfa weevil and some of the, the drone imagery. Uh, there's insecticide resistance to some products that's popping up. So we're, we're looking at alternative products and then and ways of looking at damage as decision support tools using drone technology as, as ways of, of that. Working with some other great researchers on, on the forages and how they fit into soil acidification, biomass accumulations in the soils. And uh, last, but last but not least, we're getting a project going on uh, dung recycling and uh, the recyclers, the dung beetles, that, that contribute a lot to moving that uh, dung below the soil surface. Yeah, where, it's, where, it's, where it's beneficial. Yeah. So this was a long, cold winter, Hayes, yep. and did we end up with a lot of alfalfa kill in the state? And then if we did, what can producers do about that? Can they reseed into it now? What do you recommend that they do if that happens? We did in certain spots, certainly even here in the Gallatin Valley, uh, Helena Valley, certain places, and again, it's a lot of places. Um, it was a long, cold winter, had heavy snowpack for all the winter, certain uh, warm periods actually caused that to melt and form ice. And then that ice just was a real disruptor. So, so short answer, we did have a fair amount of, of uh, alfalfa damage. There was even a fair amount of vole damage around the state. Interestingly enough, we've got a, a cultivar, Sandpoint cultivar trial with an alfalfa check in that, and the, the voles really took out the alfalfa, but didn't touch the sandpoint. So it was kind of interesting, huh. interesting observation on that. They can intercede. You want to hold off on interceding alfalfa straight back into that because of autotoxicity issues. And uh, but winter or uh, spring annuals, bar barley's, uh, triticales can be can be interceded into those with varying success depending on how much of that forage is actually killed. There may be some grass still in there. The more open space, the better better that will um, take in those seeded areas. 
So, Sam, we're coming out of a couple years of drought in Montana. What are some of the biggest challenges facing beef cattle producers in the state of Montana now? Yeah, uh, there's actually, you know, a lot of challenges in the beef sector at the moment. Um, but I think one of the big, biggest ones that are, is more of like a perpetual type thing is just uh, Montana is primarily a cow-calf producing state. We rely a lot on grazing, and that's why the drought had such an impact. Uh, Montana itself has a, you know, depending where you're at, somewhere around 100, 120 day growing season. Uh, but most of those forages that we're grazing those beef cows on is growing and done growing within probably a 30 to 45 day uh, window in the springtime. So what that really means is that the majority of the year as beef producers are grazing their cattle, uh, they're grazing a forage that probably does not meet those animals' nutrient requirements. And so in the past, it's when we'd probably give some supplement or provide some hay, some other things, but hay's getting really expensive. So one of the biggest challenges, in my opinion, is looking at how do we adopt some grazing management strategies or just management strategies where we can meet those animals' nutrient requirements while getting the um, best benefit out of the forages available um, as much of the year as possible and try to reduce some of that reliance on harvested feeds. Great. Abby, a question from Bozeman. Caught moths or coddling moths on their apple trees, is this the time of year to spray? And how do we deal with coddling moths in apple trees? Yeah, that's a, a good and timely question for now. Um, around now, so you want to aim for um, the degree day model. And so our Western Ag Research Center's website has a really good um, link to that degree day model, and it talks you through how you use that. That's the best way to determine the timing of spray application because you want to time it for when those eggs are hatched and, and when they're kind of traveling up to the the leaves and the fruits um, of your of your apples. So I would reach out to your local extension office. They can also tell you what that degree day model tells in terms of that spray window. That timing is pretty critical. But there are also other strategies that you can incorporate for coddling moth management. And some of those include IPM practices like sanitation, making sure you're cleaning up any debris or any fruit that fall off and removing them. Um, you can also do things like fruit thinning, which is going to reduce just the the um, intensity of that infestation. Mm -hmm. And there's also something called trunk banding where you can use burlap or, or cardboard around the trunk. And as those larvae are traveling um, down to find a place to, to pupate, um, they're going to find kind of little cracks and crevices and bark normally to do that. And so that cardboard or burlap can trap them and then you can destroy that and that'll reduce those local populations a little bit. So oh, nice. using a combo of those strategies. Great. Tim, I have a follow-up question mm -hmm. for Abby. So, you know, we talk a lot about degree days, but I wonder if some of our viewers don't know what that is. Yeah. And could, could you maybe tell us more, like, what that is and why it matters? Yeah. So degree like days, yeah, is that kind of, like, heat accumulation from the beginning of that um, spring season. And the way that it's important for insects is that um, their activity begins based on these environmental conditions, not specifically a date. So based on how warm it's been is going to predict when they will emerge. And so from what we know about them and the best way to kind of... Um, pair this is with pheromone traps. So when you see that first indicator of that insect, for example, a coddling moth, that's uh, a term called biofix. So that shows that first presence. And then based on what we know about their life cycles, that degree day will tell you that, let's say, within, you know, um, 12 to 18 days is when they're going to, for example, um, start to hatch. And that's when they're going to be most susceptible to insecticides. Um, so using these models is a much more accurate predictor than time windows, which mm -hmm. can change from year to year based on just that accumulation of, of those, you know, warm temperatures as the spring started, which we've had a pretty warm, um, you know, spring in, in our kind of May period. We've okay. had a pretty intense one. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, Sam, um, for people who are for kids, teenagers who might want to get involved in um, beef cattle production, what opportunities are available for youth to be involved in beef cattle production across the state of Montana? 
Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And the first thing that I usually say is, you know, get involved in your 4-H, your uh, local 4-H programs or your FFA. Uh, take some ag classes um, through your high school FFA programs. Um, but one of the one interesting um, program that I just recently became aware of is um, the Nile Livestock Show Heifer of Merit program. Um, I was recently contacted by um, a participant in that program where uh, where students or youth can apply. I think they need to be uh, enrolled in 4-H or FFA, but they can apply to the Nile Livestock Heifer Merit program and essentially they'll be uh, uh, given a, a heifer calf that they then need to feed, develop, breed, um, and do all the normal record keeping chores, things that are in, um, involved in, uh, you know, the general livestock management um, programs. And then that heifer then uh, is required then to come back to that following year's livestock Nile livestock show and billings as an exhibit, um, as a bred heifer. And then I believe at the end of that whole program, that heifer is, that bred heifer is then donated to the youth that, um, that raised it that following year. So um, there is some pretty unique, pretty um, cool programs. And, and for those viewers out there that would be interested in this Nile, um, heifer of merit program. I believe the application deadline um, to, to apply for this is the end of June, so it might be a good time to look it up online if you get a chance and, and see if this is something you might be interested in. Great. Thanks. Um, okay, so this one's for Hayes and Jane. I've out from Billings. I've controlled the weeds in my pasture and now want to get I want to do some seeding. I've heard I should seed in the spring but I haven't done it yet. Is it too late? And then if they want to know, even if they haven't seeded it, is it okay to keep their horses in that pasture? Um, so I guess uh, I'm assuming they're, they're wanting to seed a perennial forage um, uh, because it's, it is getting a little late probably for that, the soil temperature. Or just We're getting to that time where the cool season, most of the, the forage perennial species that we use are a cool season, so they are, they're more spring oriented. It's not too late for a warm season um, forage crop. Um, annuals are things like millets yeah. and, and sorghum, sorghum sudans. Um, this is about the time, it's getting me about the time to seed for those. They just need a little, the, the soil moisture to come with that. So um, uh, as far as the, you know, the, as far as itself, if it's a dry land, it's more risky. Uh, mm -hmm. Dry land meaning that it's not irrigated, it's rain fed. And yeah. so if, but, if, but if it's irrigated seeding now, as long as you, what your concern is, is running out of moisture about the time the, germ, the seedlings start to germinate, mm -hmm. and then they, we go into that hot, dry period in July, and they, they don't have that root system set up uh, to, to go through that dry period. So it's a, a short answer of saying it's a little risky right now, but uh, depending on soil moisture, it, it could still, could, and the species they were looking at, mm -hmm. the seed could still work out. Um, as far as the horses and, and management, so. We'll yeah, I, I would probably say uh, kind of the rule of thumb we give if you're doing a revegetation project in a like a weed infested pasture is to let, uh, to defer grazing for um, two growing seasons. So if they were to seed uh, this spring, which I agree with Hayes that it's getting a little late in, unless it's too late, I would say, unless mm -hmm. they have irrigation, um, you wouldn't want to graze this year because you need to let those seeded grasses get established. And then ideally you would not graze through next summer as well uh, just to let those, those species establish their root system, perhaps produce some seeds and mm -hmm. get those seeds into the ground. So two summers may be grazing in the fall of that second year. Yep. And then for weed control, what would you guys do for weed control in a pasture situation like this? If maybe you didn't get the seeding in, we might consider a millet or a sorghum sudan a warm season grass. But if that didn't work out, which I'll be honest, I failed at growing millet and sorghum sudan a lot of times. Mm -hmm. um, so how would, what would we do for weed control after that? If I, if I were thinking through that, because I often fail at getting things established, <laughs> um, what's my backup plan here for managing my weeds? Yeah. Well, if it makes you feel any better, Tim, I usually fail too when I try to grow things. Um, I think, well, you know, in a lot of situations you want to gear, like a, if you're doing a chemical application, you want to gear it towards 
the weed that you're trying to control. In a situation like this, um, one thing you can do is just use glyphosate, which is non-selective. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of glyphosate when you're thinking about seeding is that it doesn't have any activity in the soil. So you could spray weeds and seed in it yeah. into it directly. Is that what you're talking about? Or yeah, that's, talking I think about that's like what I was thinking about. I was thinking about, you know, when you have a pasture and maybe you don't get establishment through the year, what do you do with it? And I think, yeah, glyphosate or glyphosate and dicamba maybe combined to spray it out and, and try to keep it, keep the weeds down so that, could you plant a cool season forage in the fall or could you plant perennial grass in the fall? Would that be an alternative? You can. You want the, Your best success, again, is going to be a dormant seeding, so after soil temperatures have dropped. Because, okay. again, what you don't want to have happen, a lot of times in the fall you'll get enough moisture in the soil that you'll get good germination, but they don't get a root system established, so you get real high levels of winter kill. Mm -hmm. So you're better off to do a dormant seeding in the fall. And then the seed's there, and when spring hits it gets an early jump on that. Um, some of the weed management sounds like they have horses, but it could also, uh, depending on the weeds, some uh, selective grazing with sheep or goats, they're pretty good weed managers mm -hmm. if, if a neighbor... Uh, may have a, a number of sheep or goats that could turn onto that pasture, weed pasture, and, and graze that uh, during the time. That might be a, a cheaper way of doing that, um, but it may not, too. And so the, the herbicides, the glyphosate, is always a good choice with that, too. And like Jane said, it's real, very, very easy to seed back into glyphosate pastures. Yep. So we have a question from Broadview. What kind of alternative forages are available out there for cattle, maybe Sam and Hayes, you guys could talk a little bit about this. And then I have a couple of follow-up questions of my own when we think about what are the alternative forages that might be uh, these alternative forages that are out there. Well, go ahead, Sam, I'll go take ahead a stab. And, and get a stab on this. So when, when we talk about alternative forages in a grazing system for beef cattle, a lot of times as we're trying to find you know, what kind of forage is available uh, maybe outside of our traditional grazing rangelands to kind of supplement those. And so, so the two, two scenarios that I think about um, in an alternative, alternative forage system would be um, providing something in the springtime to maybe uh, delay turnout, stockpile some of that range forage, uh, delay turnout so we can maybe extend that grazing season a little bit on the rangeland. And in that instance, Hayes and I are actually working on a project um, coming up here soon where we're going to be looking at some different winter annuals that we could put in um, and I'll let maybe Hayes talk about species but uh, but what we're hope for is we put these winter annuals in that they should be available and ready to graze and then maybe even potentially be grazed um, turn cattle out and maybe there'll be enough regrowth for either coming back and grazing again or um, potentially uh, haying that or harvesting that as well uh, the other big time period where where folks are looking for some decent, uh, good quality um, forages to graze would be in the uh, late summer, fall time period. Uh, there's been a lot of interest in maybe grazing cover crops that have some warm seasons in there um, as well to you know get, get some really nice um, late season, uh, good quality forage that meets those animals' nutrient demands. Uh, but from the producers that I've really talked to throughout the state that are doing that, um, if they're successful, they either have irrigation or they got kind of lucky. It seems to be a real gamble. So with those warm seasons, if if they have the uh, if they do if it's a dry land like Hayes was talking about, and they get some really good seasonal precipitation that helps jumpstart, it can really pay off, and and folks could get through the winter without feeding any hay. Um, but on the flip side, if they don't get that summer precip. Um, it's 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 kind of a bust. Is kind of the experience um, with. With that being said, if you do have some irrigation, those warm warm seasons can be a pretty good um, uh, be a pretty good um, source. But. Yeah. So, with with these warm season forages that we're trying to grow. So, first of all, for those listeners who might be at home going, "What's a warm season? And what's a cool season plant?" For the plant for the plant nerds who are sitting up here, it really where a warm season plant is something that grows during the hotter, drier portion of the year and really doesn't grow in the cool part of the year. There's a whole suite of cool grasses, which wheat barley, all our cool season grasses, and then most of our forage grasses are all cool season grasses. So adding these warm season in are something new to us. Corn is the really the warm season grass that we grow the most of in the state of Montana. So when we have these warm season, cool seasons, 
it's nit nitrates and nitrates in forage and um, nitrates on the range has been a big topic. Mm -hmm. Nitrates, if cows eat too much of them, they they get a version of blue baby syndrome right. is what it's called in humans. Does that happen in these warm and cool season forages? And do we have to worry about that when we think of the alternative forages? Um, I'll, I'll take a quick step. Sure, I know sure. Hay Hayes deals with this quite a bit on the forage side. And, and the, answer, the answer in the short, short essence is, is yes, that, um, that these plants can accumulate nitrates, uh, especially in kind of a cropping type system. Um, and that it can cause um, some potential issues if we, especially if we take animals that have been, say, on rangeland or, or grazing, and then we throw them just uh, directly into some um, high nitrate-containing pastures. But I'll let I'll let Hayes take it from here because I know he does quite a bit of work. Sure. Yes. Yeah, I so see, Nate, uh, Hayes. We have a nitri a nitrogen deficient pasture right, right, up on the right. so photo you can, you now, can, so maybe yeah. you could contrast between those sure. two. Sure. So nitrogen deficient pastures, you can see just looking at this pasture, I get questions about how do I tell, um, and the best way to tell is with a soil sample, uh, but just visually looking at a pasture, it's a little lighter green color, uh, but you can see the clumps of darker forage and taller forage in that field. That's pretty characteristic of a nitrogen deficient pasture. We sampled this one in the top two feet of soil. It has about 25 pounds of nitrogen, which is about half, maybe even not quite a third, but about half of what it's gonna need for that. Those darker green patches were associated with uh, animal uh, manure droppings. And um, so, and that's kind of where that, that beetle processing comes in, the dung beetle, because they're moving that manure below that soil surface. And we can see that, the, how that influences pasture nitrate availability based on getting that, because manure is, uh, uh, dung is pretty high levels of nitrogen. So get that down below, but then on the, uh, the flip side of that, if we have too much nitrate in the soil, especially our winter annuals, here we, ha oh, here we have the, one of the dung beetles, uh, uh, roller species from Montana that we've got here. So, so he's, uh, he or she is doing their job and moving that down below the soil surface where they, they put eggs on that, uh, the female does, and the larvae develop on that. And the process of trillions and trillions of these critters moving that below the soil surface, you get a lot of organic matter, a lot of phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, and nitrogen below the soil surface for free rather than it sitting up on top and on a, not available to the plant. So starting a project on that. But things like barley, um, uh, oats are very high in nitrates. Uh, barley, any of the spring annuals, uh, we don't worry about them much as in the perennial okay. crops as we do the annuals, but both the cool and the warm season. So barley, oats is particularly bad. Uh, triticale uh, are all nitrate accumulators. Same with the uh, millets, sorghum, sorghum sudans in the warm seasons in that. And so yeah, what happens, get too much nitrate in the soil, that animal eats that, um, and the microbes can't break that down process fast enough, and it ends up um, uh, as nitrite, which it cleaves off in oxygen, ends up in the blood system as nitrite. That bonds to hemoglobin, and we all know what hemoglobin does, moves oxygen. So you get varying levels of suffocation. So, so I've had millet in the field until pretty late in the season. Mm -hmm. And we, we were growing the millet for weed suppression trials, mm -hmm. and it had really high amounts of nitrates in it, so sure, it wasn't appropriate sure. for a forage. So can you wait till a number of freezes or frosts come through? Does the amount of nitrate then drop once the plant kind of freezes and, and, go, and, and dies? Yeah, unfortunately not. So you'll get a little okay. bit of drop off with nitrates with maturity of the plant. Um, mm -hmm. And some people say, well, let's wait to cut, you know, uh, you know, in the soft dough of, of some of these forages. Soft dough, the forage quality has dropped so much that you're losing quite a bit just in fiber and digestibilities and proteins. Mm -hmm. um, so short answer is the nitrates that you have going into a, a, either a harvest or into the freeze is what you've got. They're very stable. It's not like prussic acid, which once it cuts, it's uh, very volatile. So it disappears out of the plants within a week to 10 days mm -hmm. with that. So... Um, the, the best thing you can do is soil test because yep. high nitrates lead to high, high soil nitrates lead to high plant nitrates. So soil test, you can, you can send the kids out on a four wheeler or the soil probe. You, they cost $150 online. Most of the extension offices around the state have one they can, you can borrow. Take that and, and get those kids out, get some soil samples, send that in. $30, you can get a report back on the, the nitrate and all the other uh, uh, minerals or uh, uh, nutrients in the soil too, and minerals. And 
instead of just applying nitrogen on, on what you think the field needs, you're actually applying on what the field has. So we bring those up to a certain level. For every ton of forage in the annuals, we look at about 35 pounds of available N. So you'll know that. You can add fertilizer up to that point, and that'll decrease pretty substantially the, the chances of nitrates. And then I've got a graduate student that's working on sulfur and the sulfur interactions with those plants and how that accumulates nitrates. So. Thanks. There are some, uh, I was going to throw on to you, there are some, if, if by chance you get and you test your forage and it is high in nitrates, there, depending on how high, if it's not too extreme, there are some opportunities for some management strategies to still utilize those forages. So uh, whether, you you know, if it's not too high, you can usually uh, uh, graze those forages or feed those forages to non-pregnant livestock. So, you know, steers or uh, non-bred heifers, things like that, dry cows. Um, if they're getting a little too too high for even then, then there's also some opportunity uh, to just dilute those forages. So cut it as a hay and then feed it as a as a mix where you dilute those animal, uh, the nitrates in that animal's overall diet, so you can still feed it. Mm -hmm. um, but there are several examples where the nitrates are just so high that they're not appropriate for uh, animal consumption as and, well. Yeah, and one thing I'd quick add to that, um, we had a case a couple years ago where a lot of f reports come back as either nitrate or nitrate nitrogen, and the, the values are different. And we had a case a couple years ago where um, an individual read the report, it was reported in nitrate and he read the nitrate nitrogen column because the MSU guidelines, the NDSU guidelines have both of them listed. He looked at the wrong column, in which case he fed a forage that was, um, came back as a, like a 50% limited to, to pregnant livestock. And he looked in the wrong column and, and, and it was actually extremely toxic. So he fed out a do not feed level forage because he looked in the wrong column of that and ended up with uh, quite a few animals that died out of that. So just as a, for those of you that get forage tests, understand that nitrate, nitrogen, that NO3-N and NO3 columns are not the same. You need to, to make sure what your report comes back as. All right, thanks. So Abby, Jane, maybe me, we have an interesting question here that was sent in. Their HOA recommends using dish soap in water as a non-toxic way to manage dandelions on my lawn. Is this really effective? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I couldn't imagine how that would be effective. Any, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I don't think it would either. You'd get some very clean dandelions. Yeah. Yes. But I don't think it would kill the dandelions. Now, sometimes it might soap... wash the aphids off the dandelions. <laughs> You'd yeah. have healthier You'd dandelions. Get healthier dandelions. So, yeah. perhaps. Eat them. I mean, yeah. sometimes dish soap is used as a surfactant. Mm -hmm. So what it does is it's used like if you have a, a solution with herbicide in it, it helps the herbicide penetrate the leaf tissue. So I don't know if it's getting if that's there was some confusion there, but I can't imagine dish soap and water. Even if you used vinegar to try to yeah. manage your dandelions, you might burn the tops off, but they'll just grow right mm -hmm. back from below the surface yeah. and they'll be back again. I've been yeah. digging some dandelions out with, you know, tap roots that are almost a foot deep in, in some instances. Mm -hmm. So it takes a lot to really get those yeah. dandelions and dish soap. Yeah, and even in, in terms of that, like household vinegar, just the percent of acetic acid is so low um, that it's probably going to be far less impactful on any weeds as opposed to horticultural vinegar, which is about, tw I believe, 20%. Yeah, maybe even 35%, um, yeah. percent, where yeah. I think like table vinegar is like 5% mm -hmm. acetic yeah. acid. Yeah. yeah, in a lot of yeah. places in the world they sell cleaning vinegar that's 10 to 20% acidity mm -hmm. and I think that's about the same that they're using. Okay, we have a caller from Great Falls who has a question. A gardener that has juniper trees in, in their third growing season is trying to control what his neighbor calls wild morning glory, which I'm gonna bet, guess is field bindweed, commonly called field bindweed. Also, wild morning glory is not a bad common name. Is there any chemical that they could use to get rid of these morning glories without harming the juniper trees? 
it's climbing into the juniper trees. Yep. Yeah. And I've seen this around town quite a few times, so yeah. this is not I, a I see, new yeah. problem. Yeah, field bindweed. I've seen it climbing up smooth brome. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it's a it's a really uh, tough weed. Yeah. I mean, you could wipe glyphosate or wick glyphosate onto the leaves. Yeah. Um, can you? I was wondering about triclopyr products. I, can you spray triclopyr under the drip line of trees? I would want to look at a label. Yeah, I would have to check the label of triclopyr. Triclopyr is an active in, active ingredient okay. that um, is sold in some different types of herbicides that are approved for turf and ornamental. Mm -hmm. But I would certainly want to check that label and see what it says okay. in terms of mm -hmm. herbicide under well, the drip, what's called the drip line of a tree, which is basically how far out the branches are extending uh, from the tree. Okay, we have, another, we have another caller from Bozeman who has said, I have a lot of problems with flea beetles, in, uh, flea beetles in my garden last year. What does Abby suggest to control the flea beetles? Yeah, um, I mean, there are contact insecticides that you can use on your plants that would be labeled, but I like to use a combination of IPM strategies as well. And so what I would recommend, um, trap crops work fairly well, and they really like eggplants and radishes. So if you're not a fan of one or, or either of those, planting those a little bit early before <laughs> your desirable plants so that they're kind of the taller ones in your garden, they'll go for the taller plants first, the bigger plants. And then kind of just doing some, some cleanup if you have weedy areas around your um, garden beds, removing that, those weeds because that could just be extra habitat for those insects. So using a combination of those strategies. You can also screen your plants um, with kind of row covers um, because a lot of times the damage can be pretty significant even in a couple of days. So using row covers over your desirable plants to physically prevent those insects on there. Um, again, if you have plants that need pollination, you'll need to remove those for when they're blooming. Um, but uh, row covers can be a good strategy too. So are you sacrificing those trap crops? Yeah, you're basically okay. sacrificing those trap crops. Yeah. Interesting. So do we, okay, great. Thank you. Okay, we have another call from Big Fork. Two years ago, he logged 40 acres and got an influx of Russian thistle and mullen. How would you go about controlling these plants? Is That's, that for me too? I think that one's one for you, Jane. Okay. I might, yeah. Yeah, well, so like the, I'm thinking about the Russian thistle. Um, so the logging operation is a disturbance. Yep. Weeds love disturbance. Um, both the invasive noxious weeds and, you know, the little nuisance weeds. I would put Russian thistle in that category of kind of this nuisance weed that's going to show up after soil disturbance. And, you know, you've removed the canopy cover and all that vegetation that was using the soil water and the nutrients. So now it's wide open for something else to grow. I would be a little bit patient with the Russian thistle um, in terms of, I mean, a lot of times after disturbances like that, you'll see two, three years of maybe a lot of annual weedy stuff while it's waiting for the perennial plants to kind of come back and occupy the space again. So um, Russian thistle, I think maybe just be a little patient with it. it mm -hmm. I'm guessing it would decrease over time. The mullein may be uh, decreasing over time. That might stick around a little longer. Um, so do you do think the canopy has to close over the forest? After he's logged, he's kind of opened it up a little bit. Do you think really before the Russian thistle and the mullein move on, the, really the canopy of the forest is going to have to, or the shrub layer yeah, is going to have to recover? I mean, maybe not the forest canopy because, you know, that may be decades, right, yep. depending on what sort of logging was done, if it was thinning or if it was just clear cut. But I think even with the, the perennial grasses and the perennial herbaceous plants coming back over time, those weedy plants, especially the annuals, will be less problematic. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. I mean, fingers crossed. Yeah. But Hay I would give it Hayes a little some, bit of time. Hayes yeah. has some pastures out east right. east of the studio here, <laughs> right. and they looked pretty weedy for a couple years. But right. then they had some of that beautiful sand foin in the right, picture that right, we saw right. later, and they really they right. came back. Yeah. So, but I, I agree with what you know, what Jane's saying. It's pretty similar um, situation in seeding forages that first year, especially if you have a mixed, you know, a, a like a, a, a annual legume and a grass, your herbicides are limited when you have those. You can't select for a broadleaf or a grass. So, the, the you know in that situation, you're kind of at the mercy of the weeds yes. that come up. So you're you try to get in, get seeded. You know, you, maybe you put on a glyphosate application mm -hmm. first or something, seed into that, and then it's that first year where you really deal with the annual weed problems. But once those perennials get established, they really choke out and shade out the the future annual problems. It might last a little longer in this case just because that doesn't sound like they're gonna if they're logging it's probably you know steep hillsides they could broadcast some you know some native seed that uh, of grass seed and forbs that would help rejuvenate a little quicker maybe in that yeah the other thing i was thinking about too and it's it's probably not possible like like case said it's probably a little steeper situation but if you could do anything to stop those plants from producing seed right, right. Yep. this summer like i mean I don't know if mowing would be an option, but mowing before seed production or okay. weed whipping, you know, again, mm -hmm. I don't know how big of an area this is. Also, 40 acres, he said. mullein is a taprooted biennial, so if, if it's a situation where there's just scattered plants and, you know, you have the energy and, I don't know, maybe your kids or grandkids are looking for summer fun, you could go out there and, like, pop that out of the ground with a spade. Yep. It's got a very pronounced taproot, mm -hmm. um, and you could take it out of the ground before it flowers and produces seed. Okay, we have another question from Corvallis, Montana. This one's probably for Abby. He has yellow and bare spots in his lawn, which are getting larger. When he dug down to reseed, he found small ants and white eggs. What is wrong and how might he fix it? So that is complicated question. So it'd be hard for me to, to kind of make a recommendation in terms of what's wrong without really taking a look. So this might be a really good one to contact your local extension agent and bring in a sample so they could test it for any potential pathogens that might be there or kind of um, see whether it could be, you know, a nutrient deficiency or, you know, a nitrogen injury from, you know, your pets or something like that. Um, but that would, this would be a good one to reach out to your local extension office and, and um, get a sample to the Scudder Diagnostic Lab to kind of rule out any any pathogens. Can ants do that? Like would the ants I, below ground be? I don't think so and, and depending on you know what size of the eggs it could be the eggs of the ants themselves so there could be other types of um, you know insects that are in there but um, I don't I don't think that ants could do anything to damage your turf grass. Mm -hmm. We have a caller from Sydney, Montana, who has who loves Montana Ag Live and has a bad hawkweed infestation under his cherry and apple trees. Well, it's not in pulse crop, so that's not my. <laughs> what, what what should he do about this infestation? So, for oh. those listening out there in the rest of the state, narrow leaf hawksbeard um, is a weed that is really kind of common in the northeast portion of the state. Mm -hmm. It's a little hawk's beard, um, yellow flowers, and it can be super weedy in a number of different crops. But myself, Jane, and Shelly Mills have written a mod guide about it, and I bet yeah. Jane mm -hmm. actually probably remembers what's in it. Uh, not really, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, Shelly Mills did her uh, online master's program on, on uh, narrow leaf hawk's... Mm -hmm. Hawk's beard. Hawk's beard. I yep. was thinking hawk weed, which yep. is a, a different species yet. This is under some fruit trees, is yep. that right? Mm -hmm. I would I would just try a combination of mowing it again to keep it when you see flowers, take that plant off with a mower. It's it does rely on seed production to reproduce. Yep. It's not rhizominous, there's no creeping and crawling. So trying to stop the seed production, so probably a combination of mowing and maybe just some hand pulling if, if that's feasible. You know, narrowleaf hawksbeard has a super shallow 
root yes. system. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so you can really, it's almost one you can get with a hoe really ho easily yeah, without pulling. too much effort. Yep. And, and get it and chop it out. I think when you mow it, it kind of sits there in that low rosette and always just waits to reflower. Yeah. When it comes to mowing weedy species, noxious weeds or other, you know, we tend to want to start mowing it as soon as we start seeing it grow up. But the trick with mowing we weeds to control them, weeds that reproduce by seed only, is to let the plant grow up, get that bud that's starting to open up, and then come take it off with the mower. Mm -hmm. Then you don't get the plants that only grow this tall and still flower. So you need to be patient if you want to use mowing to control weeds that reproduce through seeds only. Mm. Okay. So, Sam, well, I talk a lot about precision ag with a number of different people. How does precision ag, and this is a question that came from the Guilford area, how does precision ag get combined and used in cow-calf production? And what are some of the ways that precision ag can be used in cow-calf production? Yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> I've actually found myself in this position of talking a lot about a technology and technological advances in beef cattle production systems. So it's a, a question that's right up my alley, actually. But uh, always when I talk to producers about this is that when you think about the context of precision agriculture and like monitoring on an individual basis or, or building a management plan on an individual basis or crop field basis in the agronomy world, um, Beef cattle producers have been doing some of this for quite some time. You know, you start thinking about breeding programs, artificial insemination, embryo transfer. So we, we've been doing some things that have been, I would deem as precision ag for a while. Um, I think some of the things that are really new to the beef industry is the use of like sensory technology and sensors and equipment. And so probably one of the biggest popular things right now would be the virtual fence system where uh, you basically have a GPS uh, functioned shock collar like similar to like what you'd have for a dog or something and you can get on an online platform and you can designate where these cattle go um, when to move them opening and shutting virtual gates things like that so I think that that is one of the big things that's been really pushed in the beef industry and I think it's got some real potential I think for allowing for crop livestock integration so maybe gra grazing some crop aftermath or grazing um, some uh, cover crops or things like that where uh, the agronomy side doesn't want to put in a bunch of fencing infrastructure. So I think that's some application there. Um, there's a couple other things that are coming coming up in the uh, beef industry that's really interesting and that's the use of activity sensors and GPS similar to like what would be in a Fitbit or your cell phone, things like that. And so some of this has been done in the dairy industry and they're starting to move it towards the beef industry, but these would be like an activity sensor ear tag and what the hope would be would be to monitor animal activity so that you could tell maybe if an animal was becoming less active or getting sick. Um, the other things that they're using these for or hoping to use these for is to uh, for heat detection so they have been able to do it in the dairy systems to identify animals coming into heat and get them to breed. Uh, they want, I know that there's a lot of companies that want to take this technology and use it for calving detection so that you would Basically, rather than having to night calve all the time, you basically get a cell phone or a notification on your phone saying cow 2037 is in the process of calving, and then you can go check on that individual. Um, and so that's coming. I think there's a lot of people interested in that. The, the one that's here now that's kind of interesting as well is uh, there's a couple companies now that are producing solar-powered GPS ear tags that you can put on your cattle um, that either there's a couple different brands some uh, contact or communicate through like a Laurel One radio receiver and some through cell towers but uh, it's a way that you can get real-time information on tr GPS tracking of your animals and then look at how your animals have tracked across your pasture and look for um, different um, different uh, distribution patterns I actually uh, talk to a company who in their ear tag is also putting a Bluetooth transmitter so that their hope is that if you're bringing a group of cattle in, you can put your cell phone or a receiver on a fence post and as you push them through the gate, it gives you a count and gives you, tells you who's present, who's not, uh, things like that. So 
Uh, there's a lot of cool things coming <laughs> down that uh, that are really helpful. Um, that could be really helpful, and like those some of those solar powered GPS ear tags are actually commercially available now. How does mm -hmm. the, the the cost compare? Um, you know, I don't even know what a mile of fence costs anymore, but I know the, some of the questions I can see coming up is what is what is virtual or electronic fencing cost compared to a structural fence? Yeah, so so the numbers that I last read um, about for the virtual fence is uh, you do need a lower one radio antenna receiver, and those are those can be kind of spendy at least for this virtual fence program. Um, so those have been running, I think, somewhere in that ten to twelve thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Um, and then the company Vents, that's kind of, I think, the leader in the virtual fence right now, um, leases you a collar, an individual collar for a year round. And those lease costs are, um, they were $35 a piece, and I think they might have jumped to 40 or 45 um, which I know that all sounds really expensive, but the last uh, fencing quote I got for a mile of rangeland uh, four wire uh, uh, would pay for all of this. Sure. So, yeah. Um, there's, Not yeah so especially with the labor shortages that yeah, we have now, yeah. it's hard well, to get yeah, people to do some fencing. Absolutely, yeah. Not even just to mention with, depends on where you're at, if it was cover crop, as soon as you put in a fence, you've got weed management issues because you, you can't get yes. either the, the, the equipment or something to that fence line or seating. You've always got a bare patch. So I can yeah, see a lot of applications for that. Yep. Yep. Abby, we have a question. And this is, I've seen this around Bozeman quite a bit too. The tips of a young maple tree that was planted in front of their house three years ago was not greening up very quickly this spring. Do they need to prune it? What's the best time and what might be the best method? Yeah, so we have seen a lot. We had a really, really cold um, and long winter and a lot of, especially it was three years old, I believe you said, um, a lot of our, our young um, trees as well, but all of our, our trees, even if they're mature trees, um, have seen a lot of winter damage or winter kill. So whether that's dieback in the tips of branches, that's possible. Sometimes they could just be slow to leaf out. So if you're not sure whether or not those tips of the branches are alive, I would do a little scrape test to check if there's living tissue underneath, whether it's like, you know, white and green underneath uh, or whether it's just brown and dry. Um, that'll tell you if it's alive or dead. If it's dead, you can remove those branches back to living tissue. Um, uh, but overall, um, we've, we've seen kind of a lot of these, these winter related injuries this year because of of our, our really long um, winter. But for issues like pruning um, and, and information about kind of managing some of these tree issues, we have this gardening workshop coming up next week. Um, and so our, our spring gardening workshop in Bozeman, it's gonna be at Museum of the Rockies. Um, there should be a phone number that pops up next to it. If so, if you want more information, you can contact that phone number. That's the Gallatin County Extension Office. And the topics that we're covering are xeriscaping, uh, vegetable gardening, pollinator conservation, and common tree issues. And we have great speakers, including Dr. Mac Burgess from the Plant Science Department covering veggie gardening. And we have Sarah Eilers, who is our Master Gardener Coordinator, and she's uh, a certified arborist who's going to be talking about tree issues. And so uh, a lot of great topics that can help answer some of, um, some of these types of questions. Good. Great. I'm sure it'll be a great workshop. Mm -hmm. Jane, what did you bring with you? You have some show and tells in front of yeah, us here. Yeah, I always like to bring a show and tell. There's no shortage of show and tell right now. Everything's growing. So today I brought with me, it's actually a, a native annual plant. It's called Nyctelia. Uh, one of the common names is Aunt Lucy, which I think that's, <laughs> I wonder where that comes from, or water pod. Mm -hmm. And this plant, it's, it is an annual, so it has that tap root that's very easy to pull out of the ground. It has these pinnately compound leaves. It's kind of, it's, it's got some hairs on it, kind of curls a little bit. And then this one, it has uh, white, whitish blue flowers. Mm -hmm. This one, the flowers are all gone, but it's now getting its seed pods, which are, hopefully you can see those. But the reason I brought this in, it's not a weedy plant. Uh, but it has been showing up in the Scudder Diagnostic Lab this year. It tends to like disturbed areas. I found this growing um, in the fairgrounds at, in Gallatin County, just in an area that they did some construction last year and the ground has been disturbed there. And uh, it does look weedy. It kind of reminds me of like sandbur or 
Tim helped me out with the, you're such a good botanist, but it is not weedy, it's native, it's probably just having a good yeah. year. You, you probably couldn't, if you sprayed it now, it probably would set seed. Even if you sprayed it with the herbicide and wanted to kill it for some reason, it wouldn't work I think because it, the yeah. seed pods are already formed, it's yeah. already been in flower. It's and past it's the stage where you would mm. wanna, where you would wanna control it. But I learned this plant just this year. So it's the mm -hmm. first time I've ever noticed it. <clears throat> and uh, Noel at the Scudder Diagnostic Lab kind of helped me figure out what it is and shared that it's been coming into the mm -hmm. clinic this year. Okay. Is there a part of the state you see that more in or is it? Um, you know, I looked on the Natural Heritage Program mm -hmm. and it looks like it's native to about seven eighths of the state. The okay. little part of the state that it didn't look like it was common to was kind of the northwest okay. corner, Missoula okay. up to Eureka. Okay. Lincoln County. Yeah, it's out. Of, pretty common out of Fort Ellis, actually. <laughs> yes, 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 I've seen it. <laughs> when I was sitting there, I, I didn't yeah. know for sure what it was, but I'm seeing. It, I was like, uh oh. Tim's really giving you a hard time about your plots. Yeah, exactly. How weedy they, are. <laughs> weedy they were. They were. Yeah, the okay. only thing that's weedy out there anymore is Tim's stuff. Now. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. That's true. Um, okay, so we have a few more questions to, um, for tonight. So between Ovando and Sealy Lake, they have red sorrel, sheep sorrel. How could they control it in a pasture, a dry land pasture? I'll let you, you two maybe yeah. answer that question. Yeah. Hayes and Jay. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm struggling. Yeah, yeah I, that's one I'd have to go to the resources and yeah. look for some herbicide. If, yeah, if it's, it's a, a yeah. herbicide. You know, I've actually, quite a few people have asked me about that. A lot of people out towards the Plains, Thompson mm -hmm. Falls area about managing it in pastures. Hmm. And um, I think it can be pretty hard. It likes acidic soil. I can tell okay. you that much. It's much more common in acidic soil. If it's a dry land pasture with a mix of grass and, and forbs in there like alfalfa or something like that, I think it's, it's pretty tough to focus on it. But call Jane Mangold on Monday and she'll look it up. And I will. I will look it up. And I might ask Tim to help me out. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay, another question. We have a question from Bozeman. Is it safe to spray glyphosate under mature trees like spruce crab apples to control weeds? Most of the trees are mature, but one is one year old. Abby, maybe you and I can. Yeah. Um, so if you don't get any glyphosate on the tree, you should be okay. The, the exception to that, I think, would be if you're spraying a tree that might have any suckers. Yeah. I'm thinking about aspens or I've seen like the, what is it, the the choke to the red choke cherry mm -hmm. that um, that anything that suckers if you're getting glyphosate on those suckers it could be translocated then up into the main tree yeah I would agree with that I, w I would say you'd be fine as long as it doesn't touch any any parts of that tree yeah okay we have a we have a, a call from East Helena trying to manage cheatgrass in her horse pasture what is the best stage to mow it at? And how might she get rid of that cheatgrass and improve the pasture? Yeah, I, I'll take that one, to jump in sure, if you want yeah. to raise. But the time to mow it is um, just before it's getting that reddish purple color. So like in Bozeman, now would be a great time to mow it. We're usually a little bit behind the rest of the state yep. in terms of cheatgrass de uh, development. So I'm not sure what it looks like in Helena, but I think we're hitting that stage in quite a few places in the sure. state where it's getting too late to mow. You have viable, once you see it turn that reddish purple color, you have viable seed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what, what I was gonna say, is just make sure before it gets to the viable seed, and the, the old kind of joke is that cheatgrass as a forage is good for about 15 minutes in the spring and about 10 minutes in the fall. Yep. So, so I can Are, understand why people would wanna get that out of their pasture. Yep, absolutely. Um, let's see, what else do we have for questions here? We have Abby, we have a question coming in. Moss is taking over my lawn along the fence. Why is this happening and is there anything that they can do about that? Yeah, so <clears throat> moss usually likes really, um, you know, high moisture areas and then shadier areas. So um, it's just an opportunistic uh, organism. It's going to take over places where your grass isn't necessarily doing well. So if you have a really shady section next to that fence, that could be where your grass might be thinning out and the moss is, is kind of taking over. So in terms of that, you know, I um, you can 
then um, what I would say is, is if depending on what type of turf grass you have, if you haven't tried a, a more uh, shade tolerant turf grass, like fine fescue is our most uh, shade tolerant type of turf grass, you can try that in that place. Um, but if it's getting too much shade, um, that's, um, grass is just not going to grow well there and any kind of opportunistic organism is going to um, utilize that. So you can change that into, you know, um, a, a small landscape bed um, with more shade loving plants incorporated in there. All right. So we have just about a minute left. This person, this caller has a quick question, Jane. Poison hemlock, they know it's poisonous, but is the entire plant poisonous? Will it hurt if their dog runs through it? Yeah, it is. The entire plant is poisonous. You do have to ingest it. It's not, doesn't have dermal toxicity. So if your dog runs through it and, you know, doesn't get juices on its <laughs> body, I guess, and lick itself, it would be okay. But ideally, just keep your dog out of the poison hemlock because it is a highly toxic plant. Um, yeah. All right. Thanks. And thank you to, tonight to everyone on the panel, Sam, Hayes, Jane, Abby. Thank you guys for all being here tonight. Next week's show, June, Sunday, June 11th, Healthy and Happy Ponies, Amanda Bradbury, equine nutrient and physiologist. For more information and resources, visit montanapbs.org slash ag live. Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, MSU Extension, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, the Northern Pulse Growers Association, and the Gallatin Gardeners Club.